So good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Luzzi, and I am one of the co-organizers of Perspective 2022, part of the SAGSA Global Connects. Uh, I co-organized this uh, doctoral symposium with uh, Professor Joseph Delap and Dr. Martin Zillinger. This evening, I have the pleasure and the honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan. Uh, Tina is an art historian specializing in modern and contemporary art with a focus on the uses of new media technologies since the 1960s. This evening, uh, she will be speaking about uh, a major exhibition she curated, Difference Machines, Technology and Identity in Contemporary Art at the historic Buffalo AKG Art uh, Museum, formerly the Albright Knox Art Gallery. Uh, she has been uh, assistant curator uh, there since uh, 2017. And um, Difference Machine has been awarded uh, the 2022 Award of Excellence by the Association of Art Museum Curators. So uh, please join me in greeting uh, and thanking uh, Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan for joining us this evening. Hi, Tina. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you for the uh, physical clapping and also virtual clapping. I appreciate both modalities. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, here we go. There we go. Uh, so I am here today, and I really appreciate the invitation um, to speak about Difference Machines, Technology and Identity in Contemporary Art, which is an exhibition that was presented by the Buffalo AKG Art Museum last fall. And I'm very happy to say we'll soon be touring the United States starting in January 2025. So um, unfortunately, I can't make the venues and dates public quite yet, but if you're interested in potentially having an opportunity to see the show um, and we'll be over here in the States throughout 2025, um, uh, watch this space, as they say. Um, we'll definitely be putting more information about that out on our social media channels. Um, so I just wanna preface this uh, presentation about Difference Machines by highlighting that in fact this exhibition was co-curated. So I was one of the two curators along with my uh, brilliant friend and fellow Buffalo resident, Paul Venus. Uh, Paul is an artist who since the 1990s has been working with emerging media to create uh, really thought provoking installations and artworks that explore the social consequences of technology. And so um, I'm showing you Paul here on the screen, just so you can imagine that Paul is sort of standing next to me here. Uh, this is exhibition is a project that we developed very closely uh, in the first uh, months of the pandemic. Um, and it greatly benefited from all of the amazing thinking that he's been doing over the past few decades about this very topic, as well as from his very deep knowledge of the history of media art and his expertise as somebody who regularly installs media artworks. So um, Paul's own practice, you know, something he's been very interested in for a long time is, uh, is the construction of difference. He's very interested in how difference is what we think of as a social construct. Um, in other words, it is not something that is innate. Um, and when I say difference, I should clarify that I don't, you know, mean, uh, you know, that we have no physical differences. Obviously, we have, you know, people have different heights and hair colors, et cetera. But as a as categories of identity, categories like race, categories like gender, categories like ability and disability. Um, that these are uh, to no small extent, in fact, social constructions. And so this understanding of identity extends um, back particularly to the 1990s uh, when uh, you know, a lot of scholarship in the humanities was concerned with this topic, thinking about the writings of Judith Butler, for example. Um, and so um, Paul was very much formed as an artist by this moment of critical theory in the 90s around difference. and. Um, he uh, likes to invoke the work even of Linnaeus going back to the European Enlightenment to explain that not only is difference the social construct, but in fact, 
the very idea of difference is very closely tied to a European enlightenment model of the world in which classification uh, was sort of a, a necessary precursor to colonization. Um, and so I don't want to get too lost in the weeds on this, but I just want to say that it's one of the basic assumptions behind the exhibition is that difference is a social construct and that as a social construct, uh, especially the modern categories um, that we uh, employ, uh, that those are tied to a particular moment of European history and were closely related to certain ideologies um, and to the force of colonization. So in the um, sort of mini catalog or brochure that we published in conjunction with the exhibition, which is available on the museum's website, um, one of the essays is about difference machines, the exhibition and the artist, but we also wrote a smaller essay, um, which I'm showing you here called Constructing Difference, Identity as Social Construct, because we understood that not all of our museum visitors might be comfortable with this idea, right? They may not have been sort of steeped in this school of thinking from um, the 90s onwards in critical theory. Uh, and so we just wanted to familiarize everybody with the idea that, you know, gender, right, is not something you're born with. Um, and um, so we have a short essay sort of outlining that. Now, um, you know, the immediate motive, so these ideas about you know, identity as a social construct have been floating around for quite some time, but the idea, uh, the immediate motive for us to organize this exhibition was the increasing prevalence of stories in the news uh, like this one. So this is a, a story that was published on NPR back in 2020 um, called The Computer Got It Wrong, How Facial Recognition Led to False Arrest of Black Man. And essentially this story is about a robbery that occurred in Detroit. Um, and there was some security footage that was captured from a security camera. And the police ran it through um, a database and it came back with a match for this man, Robert Williams, who was completely innocent, needless to say. And the police um, uh, busted in and arrested him uh, in front of his wife and two daughters uh, and uh, held him for 30 hours before releasing him on bail. And of course, if you have been following anything that's been happening in America for the last 400 years, um, you'll know that encounters like this are too often deadly encounters, right? So this was could literally have been a matter of life and death. Um, and essentially, uh, you know, this is the first instance that we know of of somebody being wrongly, um, wrongly um, held, uh, you know, interrogated, arrested because of a computer database. Um, but we know now that there are many. Uh, uh, sort of corporations uh, uh, across American society and even more you know, globally that are pushing the use of these kinds of systems uh, for the sake of efficiency and accuracy, right? So this is the rhetoric is that these computer systems will make policing, for example, more equitable and more accurate. And so what we wanted to do as curators was to sort of call out all the ways in which we need to be extremely um, skeptical or cynical about that rhetoric and to understand that computer programs are not infallible because they are designed by humans who are themselves, uh, you know, creatures, social creatures, right, that bear their own pre prejudices um, and um, uh, have their own sort of um, ignorance uh, about um, other cultures, for example, that can go in, that can literally be encoded into these systems. So one example that I think is very close to home for you guys is what happened with the A-levels um, back in 2021, right? Um, no, 2020. Oh my gosh, where has the time gone? I was like, it's last year, but it knows last year, last year. Um, so uh, if you remember the story, um, because of the A-levels being canceled due to COVID, uh, the uh, education system over there decided to use a computer algorithm that would predict what scores students would have received if they had sat for their A-levels. And unfortunately, part of the data that was used in order to calculate these you know, projected scores um, included their, uh, their address, their home address. Right. So if you lived in a neighborhood that was historically underserved 
or um, you know historically, and, and because of that historically did not have um, uh, relatively high test scores, you would be penalized for that, right? So um, this is what we mean when we say that these systems are being built in ways that actually build inequity um, and sort of systemic bias, right, into the code itself. And it's very um, uh, concerning if we think about the fact that now these programs are being used across basically every sector of society. So I've given you an example from policing, and this is an example from education. We are also seeing these kinds of systems show up in um, the uh, in employment. Um, now, many employers are using systems, computer systems that automatically calculate somebody's hireability based off of body language, for example, that is read by a webcam. Um, and of course, people with disabled bodies will perform differently and get scored differently because of that. Um, uh, we're also seeing it show up in our judicial system. Um, there is a very popular software program here in America called Compass, which is used to calculate a, sort of a, a risk assessment of people's recidivism. So the likelihood that if they were released, um, they will commit another crime. And it's been shown to be biased against Black and Hispanic defendants. Um, and yet it is still legal for judges to take the, the scores from Compass into account when they make their recommendations for sentencing. Um, it's also showing up in healthcare. We've seen that many hospital systems now are using um, uh, similar kind of systems that will recommend uh, or sort of prioritize people for treatment and that these algorithms are shown to be biased against uh, African-Americans. Um, so uh, this is a problem now that is touching all aspects of society. Um, we are seeing it, uh, you know, uh, addressed, thankfully, by many of the most exciting scholars working today. So um, on, as part of this exhibition, we have a bibliography where we point people towards some of the books that are dealing with these very questions. I think um, you know, one of the most important, of course, is Sophia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. Um, and I'm just going to scroll through and show you some of the other books that, you know, we are thinking about. And many of these have been published in just the last few years. Some of them um, are a little bit older, um, but definitely the work of people like Wendy Chun, Ruha Benjamin, Lisa Nakamura. So all um, women scholars of color, uh, Catherine Knight Steele is another one. Uh, has been very, very influential in um, how Paul and I approach this topic. Okay, so um, one thing that we wanted to point out with this exhibition is that while this is a very urgent topic that is affecting essentially every aspect of our society and is uh, finally getting sort of, you know, the attention it deserves from scholars who are becoming sort of public intellectuals because of the urgency of what they have to say, uh, artists, in fact, have been having this conversation now for 30 years. Um, and so it was really important to us to, to show how artists not only um, sort of illustrate other people's ideas, right? This idea that, that, that artists somehow, you know, they read theory and then they illustrate theory, but actually artists themselves generate theory, right? They generate their own responses to the world. So uh, we wanted to sort of explain that they're are artists who are responding to all of this new knowledge, but also have been sort of developing their own critiques and calling attention to these issues, you know, going back three decades. So um, in the main essay for the show, we have a section um, where, so this is the section here called Saboteurs of Big Daddy Mainframe, Difference in Digital Art. That, that subtitle, Saboteurs of Big Daddy Mainframe, is a, actually a phrase from the group VNS Matrix from their cyber cyber feminist manifesto for the 21st century. Um, and so we just took this opportunity in this short section to highlight some of the many, many, many artists who are not in the Difference Machines exhibition, but have been doing this kind of work for a long time. And so we also have a footnote at the very front of the essay that just lists about 20 other names of people that we could have included in this show. So a few examples here, you'll see um, the Barbie Liberation Organization, which critiqued gender roles in, in people's toys, um, Ken Gonzalez Day, um, uh, Mongrel, um, I can just keep going here. Um, Tamiko Thiel and Zara Hushmand, um, VNS Matrix, um, Skawanati, who actually is in the exhibition, um, uh, Brian Mackern, a Uruguayan artist, et cetera. 
So, um, you know, it was really about, and it you know, goes on and on. So basically just making people understand that this exhibition is a survey of 14 artists or collectives, sorry, 17, 17, 17 artists and collectives, um, but that this is actually a huge theme in um, the history of art. And that's something else that we really wanted to emphasize for people that um, while we may think, hmm, let me back that up, to the extent that people think about digital art or the history of digital art, um, I think that at least in the traditional art world, the the narrative that people have about digital art is that it is very techno fetishistic and that it is a field that is really dominated by white men, um, by cishet, you know, straight white men, and that um, essentially is apolitical. And so we really wanted to push back on that narrative. Paul is an artist, you know, who is um, a biracial black man who um, has been making work since the 90s, you know, me as an art historian who is a disabled person uh, and relates to technology partly because of my like personal experience of that, just to say that in fact that is not the full history of digital art, that in fact digital art has been one of the most diverse aspects of uh, contemporary um, sort of genres of contemporary art for decades. And so it's it's just very frustrating for us to see this sort of narrative, this whitewashing of the history of digital art. So um, that was sort of one of the other, um, you know, uh, uh, sub themes of the exhibition. Now, um, while there are all of these amazing artists who could have been in the show, I just want to briefly talk to you about the artists who were in the show. Um, and so I mentioned that we have 17, so I'm just gonna scroll really quickly. Um, and again, this is all content on the museum's uh, exhibition webpage. So that if you just go to buffaloakg.org slash difference machines, and I'll drop that into the chat, um, all of these websites that I am, um, show, or all these pages that I'm showing you now, now are available on our website. And of course, I will I will speak more at the end about the process of organizing this exhibition and the decisions that we made. But I will say this is the most robust online presence we have ever made for any of our exhibitions. So just simply the fact that each of the artists um, was given their own page on our website. Uh, that's never really been done before. The fact that each installation was photographed with those installation photos put on our website, that's never been done before um, at this institution. And, you know, part of that had to do with COVID because it was an exhibition that opened in October of 21 um, and then was hit by the surge in the fall of 21. I think that was the Omicron surge. Um, but, you know, even more so, it's really because it is a show of digital art and many of the artworks in the show actually can be experienced for free on the internet. And so we wanted to um, sort of embrace the reality of digital art and the way that it does exist um, in a sort of networked system um, and is more public. And so um, it just made sense, right? Given the content to try to have more of the exhibition sort of live online without building like a full metaverse, you know, 360 walkthrough. Um, so as you can see, the artists are really diverse. It was really important to us that, um, you know, again, thinking of that sub theme of emphasizing the diversity of digital art to emphasize artists who are um, uh, either Black British or African American, um, who are Latinx, who are um, LGBTQ, um, who are indigenous, right? We really, or who are um, of, uh, you know, East Asian descent. Like we really wanted to try to show the sort of diversity of voices um, who have been contributing to digital art and exploring this question of identity. Because of course, I think there, to the extent that we talk about identity in digital art, it's usually from a, a white feminist perspective. And that work is incredibly important, like thinking about the work that the NS Matrix has done. But we really wanted to make sure that people understood there's even more to that story. Um, so um, the, it was also really important to us to have a diversity of aesthetic experiences. Again, um, it's sort of a sub theme of the exhibition, but Paul and I are both very frustrated with the way in which digital art is usually presented in a gallery or museum context. Um, normally what we wind up with is a video running on a monitor, something that is not interactive, that is not networked, that is not dynamic, that is not operating in real time. Um, and so given, uh, you know, 
that I think one of the things that attracted us to working with the field of digital art in the first place was precisely because it was collaborative, networked, dynamic, iterative, um, you know, uh, public, uh, interactive, right? Like we we wanted to bring those kinds of experiences into the museum. So, uh, and I will say that you know historically it's it's not just a kind of prejudice where um, museums, for example, only want to show things that look like more traditional static art objects. It's also a question of capacity that many museums still don't necessarily have the the staff or um, even just like the equipment resources in order to present work that is this challenging. And it's not just about the registrars and the curators and the art handlers having that know-how. It's also, if you think um, about, you know, the front of house staff, it's also a matter of making sure that we have our staff who are able to facilitate the public's interaction with these new art forms that can be in some sense too familiar, right? So familiar that they think that they're just playing a video game and don't understand that it's actually an art experience. But on the other hand, can also be quite unfamiliar because they've never walked into a museum and been told that they can touch things. So in order to sort of deal with both of these situations, you need um, your invigilators, your docents, your security guards, et cetera, um, to really be equipped, right? You need to make sure that they have the tools that they need to facilitate those interactions. And so it requires a, a commitment from the institution sort of in all departments, right? Curatorial, education, registrarial, art handling, security. I mean, it's just like, it's a team effort. And so not to, to get everyone up to speed, right? Um, it's something that museums are still working on. But I'm very proud of this exhibition. I think it was a really phenomenal success, partly because of the buy-in of all of my amazing colleagues there. Um, so um, I wanted to show you a specific example of one work of art to sort of make this concrete and to also raise the issue of how and why um, an institution can translate a born digital networked work of art into an IRL experience, IRL and aesthetic experience. So the work I'm gonna highlight here is the work of Danielle Brathwaite Shirley. Um, and some of you might actually know of Danielle's practice. The, she um, uh, was in London, now in Berlin, but she uh, had solo shows. Her first solo shows were in London. Um, and so actually this work, uh, we are here because of those who are not. Um, is the second iteration of a work that was first um, debuted um, at the Science Gallery in London. Um, and so this is an installation photo of what it looked like in Buffalo. Um, and to explain a little bit about this work, I'm going to go ahead and show you. It's actually um, sort of in its original state. It is a website. And so that website is uh, blacktransarchive.com. And so I'm showing you here the landing page when you land on this website. This is the work of art called We Are Here Because of Those Who Are Not. Um, you immediately are confronted with a series of, of terms and conditions that ask you to um, center Black trans women and um, to, uh, to value them, to remember them, even when they are at risk of being erased, right? So um, it also explains that it is a kind of choose your own adventure experience where you are immediately asked to identify yourself and how you identify will actually change your experience of the game. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter into the game just so you can see what that means. And you can see again, the terms and conditions, the scrolling language that's extremely direct saying this is a pro black pro um, trans space. Okay, so when I start the game, So I identify as cis, so I'm going to go ahead and press the number three. Thank you. 
So now you have to continue to um, go through more terms and conditions, and then you encounter experiences where you're given opportunities to help protect uh, Black trans people. So um, now that you get a sense of what the game is sort of about and how it operates, I want to return to um, the installation here um, and show you some more installation photos. So here we go. So essentially, um, the, the, the exterior of the experience, right? So we built a little room, uh, your sort of traditional black box gallery kind of space um, within the exhibition. Um, on the exterior of it was another work or actually two different works by the artist Mendy and Keith Obadike from their black net art um, actions from um, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then there you sort of turn the corner and there is this text on a wall and then the actual experience, the artwork, the game is sort of hidden behind the wall inside this room. And so essentially we had to find a way to recreate architecturally that experience of Danielle's website where she was very clear in terms of the architectural design um, to translate this work into physical space that she didn't want you to have immediate access to it. Um, and this is really significant because uh, in the space of the museum, uh, if you think of sort of the typical museum goer, um, statistically speaking, this is going to be a, sort of a white cishet person with, uh, you know, a college education. And it's something that, you know, all museums, uh, I think, are working very hard um, uh, to sort of mitigate, right, to try to diversify our audiences to make sure that we speak with and uh, for more communities. Um, but uh, this is to say that the typical sort of statistically average museum goer is the person who is used to a certain amount of privilege and is used to having access basically to any and every space. And so for Danielle, it was a sort of important political gesture um, as well as a gesture that replicated the dynamics of the website to say that, no, you don't get immediate visual access, right? You do not immediately just get to look across the room and see this artwork. First, you have to pass through this hallway and read the terms and conditions. And then if you read those terms and conditions, you can pivot and turn into the room and experience the game. Um, now, something that Danielle and I have talked about is that I think this is kind of brilliant because if you do read the terms and conditions and you decide that you're um, you know, a prejudiced person and you don't want to enter a space that is pro-Black and pro-trans and you turn around, you have already played Danielle's game in a way, right? Like you've already participated in the work, whether you want to or not, because your decision not to play is a decision. And Danielle's work has forced you to make that decision and to not only that, but make it publicly. And that was another really interesting dynamic of, um, uh, of, of translating this work um, into, a, into an artwork that exists in physical space is that now these ethical choices that the game asks you to make before you were making them in the privacy of your own home, you could lie to the game, you could do whatever you want, but in public, you feel the kind of social pressure. You know that people are standing behind you watching as you decide whether or not you will cross the street to help a black trans woman who's being accosted on the sidewalk, right? Um, and so it brings in these social dynamics that are actually not present in the in the sort of private online version. Um, so I just I wanted to call these out to say that, you know, um, the all digital artworks in a sense are variable media that need to be performed anew every time they're displayed because they're shown on different hardware configurations, for example. Um, but that, you know, it's the curator's responsibility and dialogue with the artist to think about how to make those translations, how to install the work in a new variation in a way that is sort of truest to the sensibility of the game, right? And to the artist's own ethics. Um, you also get the chance to do sort of fun um, aesthetic things. So for example, you know, Danielle's um, vision for how this work would be displayed, it's not just shown on a monitor connected to a Mac mini on a table, right? It is supposed to create a kind of, or it's supposed to exist in a space that is um, sort of redolent of a basement game room. Like Danielle said, like, it should feel like you went over to your friend's house and you went down into the basement and you like, you know, flipped on your like gaming console and you're sitting there in the dark and there's like cool, like black lights or pink lights or something. And, you know, then you get to play this game. So, um, 
we were able to, uh, you know, uh, to source some of these like fluorescent LED lights and we put them behind the monitor, um, uh, you know, sort of emulating now this like current trend of putting backlights around everything. Um, and uh, that light really suffused the whole room in this pink glow. And Danielle was very specific that she wanted the lights to be pink um, and to sort of read as like feminine in that way. So, um, I, in terms of, I, I only have, um, you know, maybe like five more minutes um, before we sort of open it up for questions. So it, I did want to now turn my attention to talking not so much about the content of the show and what its theses were, um, but more about um, how the show was sort of organized and the way in which um, I think curators can bring their values to bear, not only through the selection of works and the presentation of works, but actually the way the whole exhibition is structured. So what do I mean by that? Well, one thing is um, I'll call your attention to um, this question of accessibility. So the fact that we made all of this content available online for people who weren't able to, to come and visit the museum and see this exhibition uh, was really important, um, whether it was because of geographic distance or because of you know um, being immunocompromised and needing to isolate because of the quarantine, et cetera. Um, so here we actually have, so every work in the show has its own page like this, where it has installation photos, and then also the full label. So, you know, every work in the show had its wall label with its tombstone. So this information up here um, about, you know, the medium and, um, you know, who loaned the work to the show. And then what we call the chat. So this is the text beneath that explains what the work is all about. And you'll notice that at the very heading of the chat, the first thing that you encounter is a quote from Danielle herself. And so every one of the wall labels, um, it starts with a quotation from the artist. We thought it was really important to center the voices of the artists in this show um, and to allow them to sort of introduce themselves or their practice. So, um, you know, this meant that at a certain point, you know, four months before the show opens, uh, we had to conduct 17 interviews. Um, and, you know, this is not like a small um, uh, a task for, uh, you know, a museum uh, to come up with sort of the, the staff time and resources to conduct these interviews, but um, we thought it was really important. And so we actually did these on Zoom and recorded them. And we also edited them into these like short two to three minute videos. And these videos were playing on a loop at the very entrance to the exhibition. And those videos are also available on the internet. So. Um, the first thing that you see actually um, when you come to the page for Danielle. So you see uh, a photo that she gave us, um, a, a short biography, a link to her personal website, and then the interview. And so I'm just going to play this interview really quickly, or at least a, a quick snippet of it. Hi, my name is Danielle Brathwaite Shelley. I'm an archival activist as well as a digital artist that mainly makes work that's uh, interactive and participatory. Uh, the work usually is an archive of Black trans people, archiving how we live our lives and the stories we tell alongside our experience that we hold. So I decided to become an artist after seeing a lot of my friends kind of be forgotten um, and a lot of my community kind of be erased from history and part of me wanted to get into the habit of recording and archiving and remembering the black trans community as a whole and so uh, the only way I knew how to do that was through art as I had no training in anything else and so I'm going to stop there but um, I do encourage you to you know you can watch all of these videos on our website um, they're all hosted on the museum's YouTube channel and so these are you know freely available as a resource and so you know we included also then quotations um, all of the videos are captioned on YouTube as well um, for accessibility um, and so then we have the quotations from the artist at the start of the chat then we have the traditional sort of chat about the meaning of the work that's produced by myself and by Paul um, there are certain terms which are bolded and these terms can be cross-referenced with a glossary that we produced as part of the brochure for the exhibition um, it's another way to think about accessibility is like, who are you inviting into this conversation around technology? A lot of the language that we use to talk about the harms and also the benefits of technology um, can be quite specialized. Um, like not everyone knows what a GAN is. Um, not everyone even fully understands what like 
a facial recognition technology is. Some people don't really know what an algorithm or a database is. And so we tried to write like as plain English definitions as possible um, for um, these terms that people, we thought people might stumble over. So that was another um, a way of thinking about who is this exhibition really for and, you know, being excited about digital art because it is something that, you know, so many people are now experiencing digital technologies in their everyday lives, it feels like something that should be more accessible and not less. Um, if the work is available online, we just link to it right here um, so that people are invited to go and experience this work and it's sort of native context, so to speak. Um, we also then included resources. So um, we asked the artists to help us, you know, what are the favorite interviews with you that have been published? Um, you know, are there any essays that you've written that you would want us to link to? And then we pulled specific quotes out of that. And all of that information gets included here. And so, for example, um, Legacy Russell, the um, now the chief curator at the, um, uh, the Kitchen in New York City, formerly a curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem, did an interview interview with Danielle. And so we have a quote here from that interview with Legacy and then a link to read the full review. And so if you keep scrolling, you just keep encountering more resources. Um, so that felt really important. Another, um, the centering of the artist's voice and also the allowing people to sort of access resources to learn more about these artists. Um, another thing that uh, was really important for us was the programming. And so um, you know, we had a lot of traditional programming for the show. So like a curator led tour, um, two artists were invited. So Sean Fader and Stephanie Dinkins were invited to give artist talks at the University at Buffalo. They have an art program there that has a series of talks every semester, um, every um, fall semester. And so we partnered with the university to bring in two of the artists to give two of those talks as visiting artists. Um, but then we did other things. Like we had a virtual film screening again because of COVID and accessibility, but I think it really worked out. Um, of this new documentary, Coded Bias, which if you haven't seen is a fantastic documentary film that is an introduction to this question of like the harm of databases and algorithms. Um, and so we invited um, a local curator who also um, had organized an exhibition about AI systems and black communities, um, Ekram Sardar, and then Rafael Lozano Hemmer, who's one of the artists in the show, who actually made a work, his work in the show uses facial recognition. And so we had a panel where we had a conversation and, you know, um, Raphael has said that he basically thinks facial recognition should be illegal except for artists. And so it's sort of a fun conversation about this film Coded Bias. Um, and, you know, again, all of this was recorded and just embedded here for people to be able to watch. Thank you oh, so much. Oh, so, so, sorry, I don't want to do that. Um, and then um, another thing that was really important to us was inviting our community to come in and have a conversation with us about the topics of the show. So um, for example, there's a local group called Pala Light Lab, which is based at the University at Buffalo, which is a connection, a collection of, um, or a collective of artists and scholars who work exactly on this topic, on the relationship of technology and social justice. And so we invited them in to talk about the work that they're doing. Um, and we also had, um, a, a program we called Sunday Insights, which is um, where essentially, instead of having a museum docent give a tour, on Sunday afternoons, we invite different members of the community to come in and give a tour of the exhibition from their own perspectives. So um, you can see here, we partnered with Buffalo Game Space, which is uh, a, an organization that um, actually teaches people in the community how to make their own games. Um, and so uh, we, one of them came in and talked about the game, uh, talked about the exhibition from uh, their experience. Um, GLIS, which is the Gay and Lesbian Youth Services of Western New York, which is a community group that provides um, safe spaces for LGBTQ youth, um, came in and talked about uh, the show from their perspective. And then finally, Professor Devanya Havis, who is a scholar at the university here, um, who actually has worked on race and disability as a philosopher. Um, and so Devanya came in and gave a tour from her perspective. And so as an institution, we just really wanted to empower our community um, to uh, share their thoughts with us. Um, and, you know, we're very grateful that it, you know, also sort of demonstrated the relevance of this exhibition to a really wide swath of people here in the region. So um, 
at that point, I'm going to, I'm going to break. I think I'm right on time. So I'm so happy to take any questions about the Difference Machines show. Um, as I mentioned, it will be traveling here in the States. So if you will be in the States in 2025 um, and have any, you know, uh, and have any desire to see it, then please be in touch. Um, that information will become more public soon. Um, and all of the um, information I've been showing you, right, this is all just on the museum website. And so I apologize if this has been a little strange to follow along. I'm not sure what it was like for you guys. Normally, I would have a keynote presentation and just go between slides. But it seemed like since all of this content's here on the internet, we might as well just do that. So hopefully it was um, not too painful for you guys on your end. But thank you. Thank you, Tina. Actually, it was very fascinating to be uh, toured by your by you in uh, you know the uh, various pages because it sort of gave us uh, a guideline how to experience uh, the exhibition remotely. Um, I will open the um, floor for questions from the audience. Um, if anyone want to ask anything, either on the chat or just turn their camera or uh, their mics off on if they are comfortable with it. Otherwise, I have a question, actually. Sure. Yes, please. Um, I, I think that COVID has changed a lot how we perceive our identity, both physically, intellectually, and spiritually. Um, my understanding is that in the U.S., especially the uh, wearing or not wearing the mask was highly politicized. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on how this has impacted um, this exhibition, how, you know, you sort of were influenced in a sense by how COVID changed our perspective on this. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So, um, First of all, I'll say, you know, curating a media art exhibition in the age of COVID um, is challenging and has transformed how I think about installing media art. Um, you know, traditionally, um, the one of the biggest challenges of a group show of digital art like this is sound. Uh, you know, you can sort of create ways to have screens facing in different, in different directions. So there's not sort of glare. Um, and so your eye is not sort of drawn to different moving image surfaces, but it's hard to corral sound, right? Sound just wants to travel. And the space in which this show is presented, um, it, you know, our main campus is actually closed for an expansion project. It was closed in 2019 and will not reopen until next spring, actually. So this was presented in a temporary off-site exhibition space that essentially was a giant factory that had been um, sort of, you know, uh, retrofitted to be a temporary exhibition space. But this factory has enormously tall ceilings and concrete floors. And so it is the worst possible place to install any audio. So before COVID, you know, the way I would have solved this problem would have been with headsets. Um, we would have essentially had a lot of shared headphones for people to use. In the wake of COVID, um, it's not so easy. Um, and, you know, and of course, like we provided um, I was actually very proud of myself for like rigging. Um, we have these stanchions that we use um, to create barriers. And so I sort of like strapped a Lysol wipe container and trash bins onto these stanchions. So we had these little like all in one units where you could take a Lysol and then toss it in the trash. And so we had those stations throughout the show because there were touch points, you know, there were areas like Mendy and Keith Obadike's work, you have to interact with a touch screen on an iPad or you have to use a keyboard. Um, you can't really show interactive art without some touch points. Um, so, um, you know, we, we made those Lysol wipes available, but something that is that close to the face um, felt like, you know, perhaps, and also headphones are a bit harder to clean than like a flat surface, like an iPad, you know. So um, essentially we only used headphones in one location. Um, we, we tried to think about getting really creative with the technology and you know, there are ways that you can sort of offer people headphones that are reactive to where they're standing in the space. There's like geolocation. And so um, it can be synced uh, wirelessly with the screen of whatever they're standing closest to. But unfortunately, that technology was something that was sort of beyond the reach of, you know, the budget and the timeline for this exhibition. 
Um, and even then we would have still had the problem of, you know, these are headphones that then would have to get sanitized between use, et cetera. Um, so, you know, uh, on a slow Friday afternoon, that's okay. But what do you do when you have, you know, uh, a busy weekend and you've got 50 people in the space and only like five headphones? Um, so, you know, these are challenges that we're going to continue to face. I will say one type of of uh, technology that was not present in the exhibition is VR. And unfortunately it was basically because of COVID because when we first developed the checklist, it was like before vaccines. It's like, we didn't even know if the show was gonna be able to happen. And the idea of a VR headset was just more than we could sort of logistically work around. Um, you know, there are really creative ways to get around that problem um, involving projection. Um, and so I was, you know, I went on a rant uh, like a year and a half ago saying like, when are we going to bring back caves, which are these um, uh, virtual walk in virtual reality rooms that don't require headsets, actually, um, and used to be quite popular, but they're very technically complex and they're very expensive. And, you know, it's not such an easy thing. And they also require a dedicated black box space. So if you don't have the square footage, et cetera. Anyway, that's a very like technical answer to your question. Um, uh, I will say philosophically, you know, I also was thinking more about community and social experience. You know, we, we talk so much about social distancing and the safety of social distancing. But one of the reasons people go to art museums or to galleries is to experience art together communally and to have a kind of social experience. In fact, they've done studies where they've asked people, like, why do you go to the art museum? And the number one answer is, at least in the United States, is... Um, to have a social experience, whether it's to like have an outing with my family or to go on a date or something like that. So, um, you know, one issue historically with media art is when you do have the headsets, for example, you're, you're sort of forcing people to have a very, um, you know, um, isolated experience or with the virtual reality headsets, right? Like there's, it's very difficult to share that experience with other people. And so, by having to rejigger our layout so that there were no headsets. Um, in fact, it allowed us to really emphasize, you know, the importance of looking at art together as a social experience, which, you know, again, in Danielle's case, for example, created some really interesting ethical dynamics, which we were very interested in sort of playing around with. So hopefully that answers. And I'm sorry, I'm so congested. So I'm like a bit tripping over my words today. So thank you for bearing with me. No, thank you so much because it's such a complex issue. And I think that we have all shared these issues as creators in the past, now, unfortunately, couple of years. So thank you so much for just um, also commenting on the small things. Um, we have two questions from uh, the floor. Don Langley was asking, can I ask if there was an impact on the institution itself in exhibiting the show, either in working with the tech or uh, the own awareness of the issues? Sure. Um, again, on a really practical level, in order to mitigate the sound problems, we invested more in directional speakers, um, which it turns out I don't love. <laughs> You know, they're great for being able to target people with sound, but the range on them, you know, there's certain kinds of sounds that sound good on directional speakers, like spoken, spoken language sounds fine, but music, anything with bass, you know, sounds terrible. Um, and so it's, you know, it's all a cost benefit analysis. Um, so we're just literally investing in new hardware. Um, I will say in terms of the communities that we serve, you know, like uh, it was really important to us to continue. And it's something we've been doing, you know, I think really well for the past, you know, five years at least is to make sure that the shows that we offer are 50% women and include artists of color. Um, and so that was really important to allow our communities to see themselves reflected, right? That they, when they walk in, they know that there are, lots of different perspectives being reflected in the show. Um, uh, another thing I'll say about the impact, um, you know, I, in terms of the awareness of the issues, I think that we're all a pretty, like most sort of nonprofit arts workers, like we're all a pretty progressive group. And I think a lot of us have been very concerned about technology. Like for example, we've been working very um, sort of carefully to think about what kinds of personal information we capture from people who attend our events. 
um, from whether it's in-person events or virtual events from our membership, right? Like as a museum, we you know need to be able to stay in contact with our membership, our supporters, but we're trying to make sure that we are all equipped to handle that information in the most ethical and responsible way possible, right? Um, and so we've had a lot more training about that kind of stuff, but I'm happy to say that that really didn't have anything to do with the show. I think we've all been sort of thinking about these things for some time. Um, it's not an impact on our institution, but I will say one of the highlights for me was um, there is a, a, a politician who represents our community in the state government. Um, and his office holiday party was to have a tour with us of the show. And it was really amazing to be walking around people who are responsible for writing the legislation that our representative would propose in the New York State Assembly. And she was walking around taking notes, you know. Um, so I don't know, I haven't seen any like outcome of that, but I would love to follow up and just, you know, see, because she just didn't know, like, you know, it's like our, the, our politician staffers were not aware of the extent of some of these problems. And, um, so it just felt really gratifying to see a kind of like immediate impact like that, um, or maybe not immediate, but to see a sort of direct impact on people who could actually propose laws to change how these technologies are used. Um, so that felt very important. Um, I do see this other question from Greg. Should I go ahead and answer that, Laura? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so this question says, in regard to the aims and objectives of the project in terms of navigator or challenging that traditional demographic that physically go to the museum and what has been learned from that, personally speaking, thinking phenomenologically of this curatorial project, it is very encouraging and refreshing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we were obviously, um, you know, it's, <laughs> how do I say this? Um, it, one of the first exercises that we do when we plan an exhibition at the museum is think, who is the audience, right? Because we don't assume that every one of our shows is for everybody. Um, we know that certain shows, you know, are really going to speak more to certain communities than others. And so, you know, for Paul and I, it, you know, we had multiple audiences that we wanted to reach, right? Like, as I mentioned, one audience we wanted to reach was like, for example, local African-American community. And to, you know, say that basically, you know, here is an institution that historically has wielded a lot of power in this community that wants to address a problem that is disproportionately affecting you, right? Like as a white person, I'm not going to be affected by, uh, you know, algorithmic bias and policing and sentencing, but I can mobilize the resources at my disposal, these institutional resources to highlight this problem, right? Um, so it's a matter of sort of saying to this community, like, you know, um, you are heard and we want to sort of highlight, you know, things that are relevant to your lives. But this show was also speaking to a very privileged community to educate them because they don't have personal experience of many of these issues. And so it was speaking to these different communities, but with different objectives, right? Um, education on one part, and then a kind of um, a space for, acknowledgement and recognition on another. And so even in terms of thinking about our public programming, right? Um, like bringing in Devanya as a, you know, an African-American scholar who could speak to, you know, who has written again about like race and disability as a philosopher, um, you know, her perspective on these issues is very different than mine. And so, you know, her audience could also be different than mine. And just sort of acknowledging that it's going to take a lot of different perspectives to reach a lot of different audiences with a lot of different messages, you know? And to a certain extent, that's true of every show. Um, but this is like one of the most explicitly political shows, you know, that we've done, but also sort of that anybody can do. I mean, there's like not more pressing right now or very few issues right now that are more sort of pressing than the issue of technology and social justice. So um, I hope that answers the question. Um, so, um, Tommaso, I see that you also have asked one more question, which is, um, if we were able to measure the awareness of your audience about inequalities embedded in technology before the exhibition and the impact of the show on them. Yeah. So I have a fantastic visitor services team that, um, uh, we capture audience response in a few ways. So 
one thing we do is we will randomly, like if we know somebody has reserved tickets online, we have their email address. And so we might email them afterwards and ask them to complete a survey. And obviously the response rate for that varies, but um, then we can collect data from them that way. But our visitor services team also will intermittently just ask people like on their way out the door, like, what'd you think? And then their responses get recorded down. Um, we also hired a special, um, what was the exact title? I forget. But, um, you know, we, we traditionally have like docents who give scheduled tours. And then we have our preservation and safety team members who are sort of walking through the space to make sure that our visitors stay safe and the artwork stay safe. But um, we have this fantastic Claudia, a uh, colleague of mine named Claudia, who basically wandered through the space and just made herself available to people to have conversations about the work in case they found them challenging, um, to help them play the games, like in case they just didn't understand how the gameplay works. Um, and so, um, you know, Claudia also was able to capture a lot of sort of first person anecdotal responses. And, you know, she would sort of regularly check in and report back. And I remember, um, you know, the first week the show was open, there were some, um, there were some uh, teenagers who had come through with a class and she said they were very angry and my heart stopped for a second. I was like, oh no, I was thinking perhaps these were students who were very, you know, potentially conservative, who were upset about the message. And she said they were angry. They said, because they didn't know this was happening and it upset them that this was happening. And they basically walked out, you know, saying uh, at the end of the experience saying, you know, like, what can we do about it? Right. And I think that that's something, you know, I was, I was active. I was a human rights activist and organizer before I was a curator. And something that we always learn from activism is like, it's not enough to just get fired people fired up. You want to give them an action item. You want to make that anger actionable, right? That frustration actionable. Um, so um, yeah, it's something that we were thinking about is like, how can we direct people, um, you know, to, to be able to do something, right? And so even just conversationally saying, well, you know, write your politicians, ask them what they know about for example, surveillance cameras, which are of course more heavily embedded on Buffalo's uh, east side, which is historically African-American than on the west side, which is historically white, you know, ask them. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so sorry, this is a very long-winded way of saying, you know, we, we did capture, we had surveys, we had anecdotal reports. And I think that amazingly, given the political climate in the United States right now, there was no pushback against the idea that, for example, we invited a black trans artist to make a space that said, if you do not support black trans people, this is not for you. No pushback, which shocked me. Um, but people were, I mean, people would come out of Danielle's room crying regularly, just saying how moving it was that an institution, which historically is a white institution, you know, would make space like that. Um, and, and allow her to have that a very aggressive message. I mean, again, that language, you know, is very confrontational. Um, and we thought it was, you know, Paul and I thought it was important to sort of to do that and the institution was willing to accommodate it. So, um, okay. Um, uh, okay, so somebody, so Gemma's pointing out that she got the chance to see one of Danielle's works at um, the World Bidding Exhibition in Dusseldorf. Um, yeah, that's the one that was the, the Julius Doshek collection for those of you who don't know. Um, and Jem was just pointing out, it was very interesting to see the audience responses that they, they thought the work was a game, but the pink gun was not working. Um, and people were hesitant to sort of make ethical choices while playing. Yeah, that particular work is very ethically challenging. Um, so yeah, ours, I think is like less so, um, in a way, but yes, it is a important exhibition. It is an important aspect of exhibitions like this and, um, asking people to make a choice. I mean, if that's part of what the artist's intention is, you know, um, then I think museums should support that, you know, we're here to platform artists and to, to, you know, give them an audience and to support their vision. Um, so 
Well, um, I think we've come to an end to our okay. event and I would That's like to take the opportunity to thank you again, Tina, for your generosity. And also because I feel that it's great that established curators uh, are so uh, open, you know, those who are so open to discuss and actually engage with uh, the community about uh, their exhibition. I would like to take the chance to thank our audience, um, the uh, SAGSA, of course, for organizing this event, the RSC uh, among the, found, the founders, and uh, as this was part of our RSC Digital Art and Activism Network, uh, the University of Aberté and Sapienza University of Rome. Um, so hopefully this is just another event of our network and we will be able to meet again and discuss again these very important matters. Thank you again, Tina and everyone and have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Everyone.